Absolutely, it looks as if what happened is it was simply not convenient at the time for anyone to admit that this was a failure. And then over the intervening decades, minister after minister has, for reasons that some are good, some are not good, none of them were adequate, um, looked the other way. Robin Cook slashed the sitting hours of the House of Commons in the name of making them family friendly. And as a result, you know, the MPs now debate legislation much less than they did. You have the spectacle of everyone being given sort of two minute speeches in which they can kind of read out a clip that they'll get for social media. For the last 20 years, we have made informal childcare arrangements illegal, right? You can, the childcare has become a luxury good, it is hideously expensive, and people have to use it because they can't make informal arrangements because we've banned them. ITV's hit drama, Mr. Bates vs. The Post Office, is really gut-wrenching television. It shows how innocent sub-postmasters' lives are ruined by a faulty computer system, a malfunctioning justice system, as well as a reprehensible cover-up. The scandal has not only raised questions about a cherished British institution in the post office, but also a really serious fundamental lack of accountability at the heart of government. Welcome back to the IEA podcast. My name is Matthew Lesh, and I'm the IEA's Director of Public Policy and Communications. Each week, this podcast asks a tantalizing policy question. Today's question, what has the post office scandal revealed? To discuss, I'm very excited to be welcoming Henry Hill to the podcast. Henry is the deputy editor of Con Home, a communications professional, as well as a very extensive commentator on the poor state of the British state. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you for having me. Look, for those living on a rock or perhaps outside the UK, I'm wondering if you can paint us a picture of what, what is the post office scandal about? So essentially what happened is that around um, the turn of the century, the post office was moving on to a new accounting software system called Horizon. And the government was warned in advance that there were glitches in the system, but it went ahead. And these glitches basically showed up as theft because it meant that there was money going through these post offices, which was then not actually appearing. Um, and the post office, instead of concluding that, hey, maybe a public sector computer contract has gone wrong again, um, instead decided that hundreds of sub postmasters had turned to thievery and they prosecuted them. And it's not just that they prosecuted them, it's that they covered it up. They told each individual postmaster that it was like they were an isolated case to stop them communicating or realizing that maybe there was a problem. And they then apparently, we are waiting on the inquiry, of course, they apparently, they and Fujitsu, the company between them, lied about the efficacy of the software, for example, by saying that it could not be tampered with externally when in fact that was not the case. And so as a result, hundreds of people have had their lives ruined, they lost their jobs, uh, many of them got criminal convictions for crimes which they didn't just not commit, but which never took place. It is a genuinely shocking miscarriage of justice. I, it, it kind of really boggles the mind. I found as a kind of interesting early sign, at first you think, oh, you put out an IT system, it doesn't work that well, but you, you didn't really realise. There were kind of warnings from, from the start that this was going disastrously wrong as an IT project, to the point where I think there was a memo from the uh, UK ambassador in Japan saying, well, I, the head of Fujitsu has been here. We know this this project isn't going that well, but, you know, it'll be really bad for UK-Japanese relations not to go ahead with the Horizon project. So it kind of got pushed through for these almost, it seems like, political reasons, and then no, no one really wanted to face up to the fact that it wasn't working that well from, from the very, very beginning, before there were, you know, any questions about sub-postmasters and, and the miscarriage of justice that subsequently went on. Yeah, that's absolutely true. And I think it, 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 that is one of the aspects of the accountability problem that we're, we're here to discuss, is that the ministers who made those decisions are long gone, right? You know, the, the timeline of a political career is not that long. And this blew up 20, 25 years after the project was rolled out. But absolutely, it looks as if what happened is it was simply not convenient at the time for anyone to admit that this was a failure. And then over the intervening decades, Minister after minister has, for reasons that some are good, some are not good, none of them were adequate, um, looked the other way. Before we dive into that a little bit more, I think there's a, a been a bit of criticism that it, I guess it's taken so long for people to start talking about as much. And that isn't it shocking that it took an, an ITV docudrama uh, to really bring this to the front of the public mind? I'm not sure that's exactly true in the sense that um, 
there, there was extensive BBC reporting for several years in the Times as well, but it really didn't seem to actually blow up in a very public way um, and really stimulate some more immediate action until it, it, it hit the, the public imagination through a, a very well-produced drama. I mean, I'm kind of wondering what that says about the way these institutions are held to account, that it takes that for it to get a strong public reaction. I mean, I, I, I understand as a, as a journalist why it can sometimes rankle journalists that lots of shoe leather and really good detailed reporting over a number of years can hit less hard than, as you say, a very well-produced drama. But that is the power of storytelling, right? That is the power of popular television and dramatizations. That's simply how people are, right? There's an awful lot of bad news. Uh, there's an awful lot of bad news about state systems presented one way, the postmaster, if, you, if you're writing it up, the postmaster thing can seem quite technical. It's about IT failures and you know various claims. And sometimes it really does take uh, a, 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 a story, a storytelling approach to really drive that through to people. Now that is suboptimal in many ways, because of course you can't make a Mr. Bates versus the post office about every single thing that's wrong with the British state. But public, public attention can, is one of the few things that can really move politicians. The problem is, getting public attention where it needs to be. I mean, I can think of a few topics that could use a, a similar mm. treatment of Mr. Bates versus the post office, but maybe we, we leave that uh, particular... Maybe someone should fund those dramas. Well, indeed, perhaps if, if there was uh, proper resourcing available. Mm. Um, if, if anyone's listening listening at home and, and interested in that topic, I'm, I'm sure we can be in touch. Um, kind of moving on to how this scandal really unpacks. So I think you've got effectively a, a first stage here of a broken IT system, then you have the prosecutions and the cover up. Um, you have uh, an organization, you know, I think there's very much joint responsibility between Fujitsu and the post office. Um, you get a sense though what's going on here from the organization's perspective. It's all kind of reputation management over, I, I suppose, doing justice. So they, they go very hard after some of the, the postmasters, especially the ones who push back because they don't want to see the post office reputation being undermined. I wonder what that <coughs> says about the way in which, I suppose, organizations try to protect themselves, particularly, I suppose, maybe high profile public sector organizations, but perhaps even more generally that, that there's just kind of like this human, perhaps it's almost just a human tendency to just protect the institution at all costs rather than dealing with things as they come up. I think that's, that's certainly true to an extent. You also often end up with a bunker mentality, right? Like if you work somewhere that's under threat, then you will identify with it and you will want to defend it. I think there's also with cover-ups like this, because cover-ups like this, unless they work, in which case we literally never hear about them, and they're the stuff of conspiracy theories, mm. they always end up worse for you, right? Like the cover-up, the tactics used in the cover-up are always just awful. But I think, and I'd be fascinated to read once it's finally done, like a full insider account of what the post office was thinking. I think there's a point where you start with a small defense, you know, you're funding, you're fighting the, in the initial fires, and then you kind of lock yourself into that because by the time that this has got into a really big problem and you're having and you're prosecuting hundreds of people, you're already in, right? You can't back out now. You'll have to admit that you did all this stuff you already did. And so you double down on the secrecy and the defense in the hope that it all pans out. That's how most of these sort of scandals based around fraud or deception end up coming apart. You end up trapped in the lie. And I think that that's probably what happened to the post office. So the other major element of this scandal that's especially emerged um, in, in recent weeks is the role, and as you were hinting at earlier, of ministers uh, as they were being warned repeatedly by sub-postmasters uh, and even by other MPs who are raising concerns to their local constituents, um, and yet repeatedly kind of pushing back against that, <coughs> repeatedly saying, oh no, this is, this is not for the government to intervene, it's up to the post office as an arms length body to just sort out. I think uh, Sarah Davey, the Liberal Democratic leader, has perhaps been the most famous person in, in this um, scenario. But of course, it was, I uh, think, go back to Labour ministers, uh, Lib Dem ministers and Tory ministers throughout the last 20 years, who've all pretty much said the same thing. It's it's not my job. I mean, to what extent do you think that's a reasonable excuse? Well, I think we, we can draw a distinction between an explanation and an excuse, because ultimately, if you are a minister and you are the minister for the post office, you do have a responsibility for catching stuff like this. And so the reasons you didn't don't excuse you failing. But we, the explanations are interesting because we have a system whereby traditionally 
that someone in the House of Commons, a minister, is accountable to the House of Commons for the performance of the public sector, the different bits of the public sector. And that has traditionally been a very important part of our constitution. And when, for example, um, Bevan created the NHS, one of his arguments was that, you know, I think the quote was, the sound of a dropped bedpan in Tredegar should reverberate around the Palace of Westminster. And yet in practice... This was already coming under strain as the state got bigger, because there was simply a limited amount of political, uh, democratic political attention available. This was the problem with the Home Office, which I've written a paper about previously, tiny ministerial team with a huge portfolio. Uh, you'll remember the famous joke in, in Yes Minister, where Bernard tells the minister that if he just puts his in-tray in his out-tray, the civil servants will sort all of it out. <laughs> now, that's actually from the Crossman Diaries, which with that, that example was from the Crossman Diaries. Uh, Anthony Crossman was a Labour minister in the 60s. So this was already a problem. And we've really doubled down on that in recent decades because we've started farming out responsibility to quangos, to arm's length bodies, to, to groups where part of the point is that they don't have direct ministerial oversight. And that raises a big question for ministerial accountability because what happens with these ministers is that they are told by civil servants, this is an arm's length body, we, uh, we are not supposed to intervene, or there's a court case and we can't intervene because there's a court case. And the whole system relies on them day to day accepting that sort of statement from civil servants, right? Otherwise it would fail. And so I, you, ultimately I still think that they should have caught it. You know, one, one sub postmaster claiming that it was an IT glitch, not a problem. Once you've got five or six different ones getting in touch with you saying there's a problem, your, your political radar should be going. Once it's hundreds, it's quite clearly a problem. But that takes time, political capital, and familiarity with the brief. And I think another problem we have is that we reshuffle ministers so often that they are often not given the opportunity even to properly get to grips with their portfolio. If someone's been post office minister for 18 months, two years, they might have developed sufficient familiarity to be able to spot warning signals. But if you're new and your post office brief is only one of a clutch of briefs that you've got, you're more likely to miss it. It seems we've ended up in this interesting situation where you've created literally hundreds of these arm's length bodies, almost as a, a fact of necessity for the amount that we expect the state to do, uh, for the amount of uh, responsibilities it now has, a, a whole bunch of whole different areas of service delivery as, as well as regulatory authority. Um, and then you've put it into a structure where you've almost distanced it from the minister. It seems to me though, rather than that being something that's, I don't know, a mistake or um, some some kind of fault of design. It really seems like it's intentional that ministers don't want responsibility for things. And that's why they're happy to use the kind of arm's length body excuse because they, they, when things go wrong, they're going to be like, oh, it wasn't me. You know, it was the arm's length body. It's somebody else who you can go blame for that uh, rather than needing to take responsibility for everything, which would just be, I, I suppose, impossible practically, but also politically even worse. No, that's entirely true. Um, it it suits both ministers and I think MPs. One thing that I think is under under underappreciated maybe in the growth of quangos and so on, especially since New Labour, is Robin Cook's reforms to the House of Commons. Robin Cook slashed the sitting hours of the House of Commons in the name of making them family friendly, and as a result, you know. The MPs now debate legislation much less than they did. You have the spectacle of everyone being given sort of two minute speeches in which they can kind of read out a clip that they'll get for social media. And part of the result of that is that now you have to outsource the actual making of regulations to arm's length bodies because parliament doesn't sit long enough to do the amount of legislating that would be need that would need to be done for even a fraction of that of those rules to come out of parliament and to be scrutinized by our MPs. And there are very limited mechanisms for holding quangos to account currently. Their, their rules and regulations aren't scrutinised properly. And it does suit politicians, of course, because, yeah, as you, as you say, as a, Ed Davey has not resigned as the leader of the Liberal Democrats yet. And his defence is, well, you know, we, have, we had an arm's length relationship and, and I was lied to by the post office. And it's in some senses, it's a fair defence. You know, I first got onto this problem when I was writing about Chris Grayling in the aftermath. I don't know if you remember that absolutely catastrophic rail timetable mm. change a few years ago. There were demands, he was rail minister at the time, there were demands that he resigned. And I was like, well, in theory, yeah, the constitutional high theory, that's how it works. But he had absolutely nothing to do with this at any stage. Like, it's a real problem in how we hold the state democratically accountable, given the vast power so many of these organisations have 
over different aspects of our day-to-day life. Yeah, I mean, it almost gives me some, some sympathy for ministers, which is it's, it's all responsibility with no power. So a minister walks in there, they, they don't actually have the technical power to basically fire anyone or do anything. They, at least not without a lot of faff. Um, and so, but at the same time, if anything goes wrong, they're meant to be accountable. You know, the, the structure of the Westminster system is we all elect MPs. From those MPs, a government is created. It's the re- responsibility of government then to, to manage the civil service and, and manage um, policy delivery. Um, and then there's meant to be, of course, this chain of accountability from us as citizens who elect our MPs holding ministers to account. But that doesn't, it's almost like that chain's broken. We, everything's kind of got into a size and a scale where, and perhaps a, a structure and institutions that don't really provide any kind of m- meaningful accountability in so many cases across so many different issues. Um, I'm, I'm not sure exactly what you can do about this, though. It seems like we're almost kind of institutionally stuck. Is it, you know, as simple as leave ministers in place for a bit longer, uh, expand parliament sitting hours, um, provide some more kind of parliamentary committees, uh, have more external reviewers. I don't know what what is the the way to I suppose deal with this this massive kind of accountability fail or democratic deficit which we've created in in the modern system of government. Well, it's a very very difficult um, thing to do. Uh, I I think there's fundamental limits to how much a reasonably sized parliament can oversee. Just how much state a reasonably sized parliament can mm. oversee. And one thing that's always been very frustrating to me is that whenever you have one of these conservative, you know, occasionally they'll have something about bonfire of the quangos, etc. And they never seem to have thought structurally about what to do with the responsibilities of those quangos, right? Because you can either reinter- reintegrate them into the department directly, which does increase ministerial oversight, at least in theory, or you can abolish them. You know, a lot of these quangos didn't exist. They're exercising powers that weren't exercised 20 years ago. The world didn't end. But that that level of thinking never seems to happen when it comes to the conservative sort of headline quango stuff. The system, I think, is coming under increasing strain. And you can see this in over the last few years, we've seen more and more sort of battles between ministers and civil servants. Ministers, the old assumption was that ministers took the blame if something went wrong. They didn't blame the civil service, ministers took the blame. And I think that sense of powerlessness that you spoke about is real. And it's one of the reasons that ministers appear increasingly to be unwilling to do that. They are prepared to say, no, this was a departmental failure. This was a civil service failure. Think about Amber Rudd. Amber Rudd um, forced to resign as Home Secretary because she gave misleading evidence to a House of Commons select, com- uh, select committee. That wasn't her fault. That was information provided to her by, min- by, by her ad- ad- um, civil servants. Now, that suggests that, you know, even people at the top of her department didn't have the accurate information. But why should she resign? Why shouldn't she say whose fault that actually was? Why shouldn't the person who actually failed, who actually was responsible for the House of Commons getting misleading information, why shouldn't they be held accountable? And that's a perfectly fair question. I think, yep, increasing the House of Commons sitting hours would definitely help. It would create more time um, for more rulemaking to be brought in house, more committees and more kind of rigorous um, scrutiny of maybe the output of uh, many quangos would help. Currently, you can call their executives in front of a, a select committee to interrogate them about a specific thing. But I don't think there's much by way of regular scrutiny of the things of the regulations they're doing or parliamentary approval of the regulations they're doing. And then you do, I think, if you really want to bring the state closer to democratic heel, have to shrink some of it because if it's doing. Like, I don't think anyone in this country can possibly have a comprehensive idea of every single thing the state does at the moment. And so long as that's the case, there will always be large parts of it running on autopilot. And yeah, leave ministers in for longer because every time you shuffle the ministers around, the departmental autopilot kicks back in and a new minister has to start swimming up that river from scratch. Yeah, it seems intriguing to me that the Tory rhetoric and it continues to this day is we're we going to cut this red tape and we're going to um, reduce the quangocracy, et cetera, et cetera. You don't seem to get very far with that. Though. I mean, you might combine some regulatory agencies together and actually not change any of their responsibilities and then leave them a bit worse off for where Public Health England being perhaps a classic example here where it was combining together a whole bunch of different previous organisations and now has been split off again after COVID because it was realised that they weren't particularly good at actually dealing with pandemics. But in many respects, the government, I think, has perhaps gone the opposite way here. They're, they're creating new regulatory bodies and have regulated quite extensively. I mean, just three things come to mind in the last 12 months. The football regulator is coming. So we're going to have a, a football quango coming in that's going to be exercised 
exercising quite significant power. Uh, we have Ofcom being given all sorts of online safety powers. Um, they've produced something like 1,500 pages of guidance and codes of conduct already. That's, that's literally too much for anyone to even begin to comprehend to try to read, let alone Parliament providing any kind of meaningful oversight of what is effectively speech regulation. And then also the CMA, I mean, the CMA has arguably been using their existing powers quite quite um, liberally, but also been giving new powers in, in digital markets. Again and again, it seems for government that rhetorically says, oh, wait, and concerned about red tape and, and regulation and, and crangocracy, um, they're going in the opposite direction. I think part of the problem is always um, that politicians are absolutely terrified of something being pinned on them. And what would happen, they worry, is if they repealed a regulation, even the silliest regulation. Take my personal bet noir, right? The window, window rules. Uh, the current rule is that new sash windows have to be hideously high off the ground to avoid anyone falling out of them. Now, there has never been a plague of people falling out of sash windows and sash windows near the floor let in more light and are lovely. But if you repeal that rule and one person, one person falls out of a sash window, you can absolutely guarantee that there will be people out there who will try and nail politicians for that, for that unfortunate accident. So there's that kind of loss aversion on the part of ministers. I think the bigger problem for the right is it lacks what I would call a repeal mindset. Right? There's this idea that's been deeply internalised by too many conservatives that the, the progressive conceit about politics, which is that it has a direction and that one side is the motor of change and one side is the brake, has been completely accepted. And that means that once the other side, you can, you can oppose something, but once the other side's done it, um, that's, that's kind of it. And so you think about what have we repealed in this parliament? I think the Fixed Term Parliaments Act is maybe the only thing. And you compare that to New Zealand where a new uh, centre-right coalition has come in and is basically spending its first first few months in office repealing a load of Jacinda Ardern's laws and regulations. That's a much... I think if you could flick that switch, if you could cross that Rubicon, the right would be in a much better place. You wouldn't go on... You know, you wouldn't need to bond, torch everything down, right? You don't need to be an arsonist or a radical libertarian to recognise that actually it's deeply disempowering to be a conservative if you don't believe you can change anything. And you do need to be prepared to actually just stop regulating some stuff. And I think you said they like to, they like to combine agencies, right? right? There's a sense of, we'll reduce the headline number, but a lot of them haven't got to the place where they're ready to think, actually, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, life ticked on without any of these rules, right? Mm. Like you can, you know, it, these aren't actually necessary. Childcare is, my, is another personal bugbear. Over the last 20 years, we have made informal childcare arrangements illegal. Right? You can, the childcare has become a luxury good, it is hideously expensive, and people have to use it because they can't make informal arrangements because we've banned them. Legally, I can't pay you to take care of my child. Yeah, you can only, I think you can only, you can only legally babysit for two hours in work time, right? You can't do it for more than that. And if you're not the parent of the child, you have to deliver an early years curriculum to this child. And <laughs> Labour is taking that to the obvious conclusion, right? They're talking about setting up childcare in schools. If childcare in schools can outcompete child, private childcare on cost, then eventually in 10, 15 years time, we'll have a school starting age of one. And the Conservatives could have changed that. They could have put in left sensible regulations in place to make sure you do stuff like CRB checks and that you make sure that no one's abusive. But they could have said the school starting age is the school starting age. Here's cash and let parents find their own arrangements. That would have been very popular and it would have been cheap. Children also weren't terribly worse off in the 1990s uh, when they didn't have um, state-funded childcare to the same extent, but also didn't have these extensive curriculum requirements for one-year-olds. Well, th this is always a slightly strange thing for me about every time that people get absolutely obsessive about whatever the very latest version of higher standards is, is that the generation that's implementing these rules didn't grow up in that system and they were fine, <laughs> right? Like they always turned out absolutely fine. The people mandating an early years curriculum did not receive one and they were okay. But the Conservatives, on no issue, have got to the point where they're prepared to do that. And it would be controversial because you have all of these standing groups that are sort of a permanent lobby for the status quo. And they mm. bake in this problem with things like consultations, right, like statutory consultations, where you have to put it out. And consultations are entirely self-selecting. They're not a democratic poll. Uh, and a load of vested interests give you their view. And then it, 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 costs a, it costs a lot of political capital to push against that. And until we get to a point where the Conservatives are prepared to bite that bullet, 
we are going to keep drifting in the direction we've been going. Yeah, and there's this whole issue with um, policy making by stakeholders of self-selected interest groups who will be the only advisors to civil servants. And I think there's almost an instinct among civil servants to, uh, rightfully so, they should consult with everyone. But then whoever they've last spoken to, whoever they speak to most extensively, that the experts in the field are not as perceived as in biased as they should be. And the other element here, though, as well, is that when things do happen in the world that there's inevitably a demand for kind of some kind of state intervention, having a kind of language and a capacity to resist that. So I think perhaps one of the biggest case studies in this is all the fire regulation that's come in after Grenfell. Now the, the Grenfell tragedy <coughs> was absolutely awful. It's not clear that much of the fire regulation that's come in would do anything to have prevented that tragedy, um, but it is imposing huge new costs. I mean, something like you need two stairwells in every building, for example, as a result of the new rules and making a, a whole bunch of developments completely unviable. And so if the government's not willing to kind of look at say something terrible happening and then say, well, we're going to change these things here, here and here, but we're not going to do absolutely everything that anyone's calling for because the costs that will be imposed by all those regulations are just too high and not worth any kind of reasonable benefit. That's, I mean, the two stairs thing is mad. I think building regulations is something that really needs more attention. The windows thing got, uh, got, got, a bit of time in the sun. But it is essentially the case that in this country, an awful lot of the features that people most desire in period and historic properties are now illegal on new builds. Stoops, large windows, uh, not having the legal amounts of staircases, mm. the ground, uh, every, every ground floor now has to be wheelchair accessible, doors need to be fire safe if they're fitted by a builder. And all of this adds costs. It means that new builds are ugly and undesirable. And it leads to this very strange situation where occasionally you'll get not even occasionally, you'll get people writing about housing policy sort of sucking their teeth and saying, the UK has its has the oldest housing stock in Europe. And it's like, yeah. And it's still more expensive than the new stuff. And you can prize my period windows from my cold dead hands. And they are cold because the windows are not properly insulated. <laughs> um, I think what you could do, it would be difficult given the sheer volume of it, is that I think it would be helpful if new regulations had to have a criteria for failure and they were sunset clause, and you had somebody, I think I once proposed something called the Office for Policy Interrogation, but there would probably be a better name for it. A, a, a quango to watch the other quangos. Uh. Um, well, yeah, yeah, precisely, who watches the watchman. But basically, when you were coming up with a, with a set of uh, regulations, you would have to actually have a, yeah, or a new law. You'd have to say like, right, what's the actual goal of, our end state goal of this? Like, what are we trying to achieve? That would have to be set. Mm. And then uh, the, the regulation would be sunset clause, say for two, three or four years. And before the sunset clause was voted on in the House of Commons, this uh, somebody would produce an actual independent assessment of whether or not it had hit its original target. And the thing that always, uh, the example I always use is the sugar tax, right? The sugar tax was originally going to be taking calories out of our diets and making us thinner. And then it didn't do that. Um, I think the, it was, took like one or two calories out of the average diet. And so they just completely moved the goalposts. They just said, oh, it was all about taking sugar out to, you know, in, in, in and of itself. And for me, that's the kind of thing, because the sugar tax, it hasn't done much for public health, and it has deprived people of an awful lot of the pleasures that they got out of drinking sugary products. And that's the kind of thing where we should be holding regulators to account, because it's not just that we have a huge amount of regulation, it's that that regulation, no one marks that homework. A lot of it is not held to any kind of independent standard about did it do what it said it would do. It's just, well... You know, you change the, you change, the, you move the goalposts, you get some sympathetic think tank to write up a report about how it's passed the new goalposts, and then we've stuck with it forever. Well, Henry, thank you so much for joining uh, the IA podcast. It's been a quite fascinating discussion, both in the specific case of a state failure in the post office, but also the broader implications that has for the British state. If you are enjoying the IA podcast, please do subscribe on your chosen podcast provider. And if you'd like to learn more about the IEA's work, just visit IEA.org.uk.